Test, test, test. Test. Yeah. Now it works. Cool, I'm gonna start. Uh, you always have to admit your mistakes. We did not think about that people in Barcelona like to have lunch until 1.30. So like even Dynatrace is gonna bring uh, half of their, uh, part of their organization and they're still at lunch even, right? So I'm gonna start anyways, to not keep you waiting. Um, just that you know, before I forget to say it, I am recording me, I'm not recording you. Yeah, so there is a camera there, but that's not on. That one is on. So I am recording us so that we can use it later for, for other purposes. And I'm also recording the slides. You can you can have it all afterwards if you want it. Um, but now we start. It's nice that you're here. Uh, and I always like to start with a round of applause for you for coming, because um, that makes me very happy that you're here. So I chatted with some of you already, uh, but I do a short introduction uh, of myself. I'm Max. Um, I worked in uh, tech for most of my life. Uh, I started as a software engineer very early. I worked in San Francisco, in London, in Berlin, uh, mostly in startups. I built very large infrastructures. Um, so I'm a proper nerd. Uh, a lot of people are very happy that I don't program anymore because they don't have to maintain my code. But um, the, this, this still hurts sometimes. Um, no, um, I, I enjoy doing this. I Five years ago, I founded an organization that's called the SDIA. Now we're changing the brands a bit. Um, and because I was a bit disappointed where we're heading with digital technology. When, when I started, um, I really wanted um, digital tools and software to really be good for people. Um, I was just joking about uh, some you know, corporate processes, HR systems that are really annoying for people. They were there 15 years ago. Now we have Instagram, Facebook, ChatGPT, all the stuff, and yet these annoying processes are still there, right? Like somehow, in a way, digital tools kind of failed us in that sense. Um, and that's why I started uh, looking into nonprofits and sustainability, because I thought, like, how can we, how can we put digital products and tools and services back on a track um, to really benefit humanity um, and not just consume resources? Good. Uh, I wanted to introduce Isidro, but he's not here. He's getting people from uh, downstairs in through the high hardcore security of this building. Uh, so I will say Isidro will be here soon. He's our host from Dynatrace. And um, I wanted to thank him, but no, it's only you from Dynatrace. Right now. Um, I, I wanted to th say thank you to Dynatrace because they gave us this amazing space. They bring all the food. Uh, they expected very little in return. So this is there's only two times I mentioned them. Uh, and that's very sweet. Um, and they are they 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 helped a lot with um, thinking about the stuff, and they implemented a lot of our work that you will see today into their products, um, which is yeah not a lot of uh, companies are doing this. A lot of people want to talk about it, but not a lot of people actually start building code. So um, that's awesome. Now, uh, by way of introduction. Um, this S12 Y has a meaning, and I'm going to let Mims explain it real quick, and you'll find out later why that is relevant, why you need to know Mims. Thank you. And you don't want me naming things. That's why I'm very grateful that MIMS named it. My first nonprofit was called the SDIA, the Sustainable Digital Infrastructure Alliance, which is very German because it means it says exactly what it is, but it's uh, not very easy to remember. Um, so I'm happy. Thank you, MIMS, for this. Um, 
The second thing that I always that I need to say, because you're going to hear me use two words a lot today, one is digital products, the other one is a digital resource. Um, if you talk to environmental scientists uh, and you say like, hey, what's the environmental impact of software? They say, well, that's very easy to answer. Software does not exist. And you're like, seriously, man, what's the environmental impact? Of but software physically doesn't exist because when you turn this thing off, so you remove the battery, you take off the power cable, everything that's on it um, gets removed from the, f physically removed from the world, right? It only works as long as it's powered on, as long as there's energy flowing in. So in terms of environmental science, they say it doesn't exist. Now, this is not very useful if you're trying to look at the environmental footprint of software, obviously. Um, so what software does consume and what software does use in the physical in, in the virtual world is the ability to store, process, and um, transport data. You might know this if you're more techy as compute, storage, and network capacity. Those are the three things that software uses, and those I refer to as digital resources. And all this physical stuff, data center, server, computer, this laptop, every phone, is basically just a, a generator, a physical generator of this. So as long as this is turned on, it makes compute, network, and storage. As long as this is turned on, it makes digital resources. Right? So this is just a proxy because software does not consume oil or energy, actually. It consumes digital resources, and digital resource, in turn, uh, consumes resource, uh, consumes physical resources. Now, that's easy way to remember it, digital resource compute storage network. Um, the second word that you're going to hear a lot today is a digital product. And now, one of the problems in IT is that we don't really have a very clear terminology, what is what. You will hear people say an IT application, an application, uh, a startup somehow also refers often to a product, which is strange. Um, but we refer to it as um, an assembly. So you take, most of the time, if you build software, you, you write a bit of code, but you also take open source or proprietary components to assemble them into a piece of, uh, into another piece of software. Um, and that software then consumes resources, compute, storage, and network, and is amplified by the size of audience. Right? So if you, if you take a WordPress site that you assemble with some plugins, right? you, that's your assembly, um, if that WordPress site needs a virtual machine with four gigabytes of memory, two CPUs, and some 100 gigs of storage, uh, but it has one billion users, then the scale of that resource consumption is amplified a lot. Right? So scale, uh, the, the message here is audience and scale really matters uh, when you think about this. Good. Clear so far? Good. Now, um, I make this now as a joke, but it's important. You can break down the discipline of making digital products into three, into three things. Um, what it does, how it's made, and how many resources it needs to run. Yeah? You could say, like, when you take the example of a car, you can make a car fuel efficient, and then it needs less fuel, um, and the resources it needs is fuel. Um, but you could argue that driving a car around in a circle for the whole day, that's not a very good use case, or it's not a very sustainable use. Now, the moment you go down that path in software, you get people like shouting, like, we should outlaw blockchain. AI is bad. This actually, like, half of the internet is bad. Okay. But it doesn't, so it doesn't actually, that discussion doesn't move us very much forward because it's not in our realm of influence most of the time. Like, we cannot, if, if I work as a software engineer in, a, in an e-commerce company, I cannot go to the CEO and, like, you know what, we should stop selling stuff. Uh, that's a bit... It's a bit awkward. So today we focus on these two parts, how it's made and the kind of resources it needs to run. Yeah. So this, this discussion we park. This discussion is a philosophical, values-based, and often political discussion, like what's good and what's bad. Um, Mims came up with this. No, kidding. Um, he did. Um, I talk a lot now about digital resources, so you know now what they are. Let's look at what they're made of. Um, and you can think of this as software having side effects, like medicine has side effects, and it's the part that we often forget. I'm not going to show you fancy graphs of energy consumption, blah, I'm going to just show you pictures, okay? 
it's, I think, more fun. Um, so digital resources create environmental impact. Electronic waste, good number to remember. Last year, the European Union created as much electronic waste in tons as the weight of the Chinese wall. Right? And no, this cannot, there's no magic machine where we shred this through and out comes all the cobalt, lithium, blah. This is, it's gone forever. We mine it, we throw it away, it ends up in a river somewhere, it will poison our water, it's shit. This should not happen. Second, servers are not made out of wood and paper. Computers, this is definitely not made out of wood and paper. Um, and th there's very little material in here that you can somehow recycle or that's renewable, right? Um, this is actually us disassembling a very common server and you can kind of, like there are CPUs here, picture is not so sharp on the screen, um, but it's a lot of parts and um, a lot of different components that are very hard to reuse or refurbish or in any way give a second life. Yet in most, uh, actually Meta was, uh, became famous that they were so kind um, to um, decide that they are not gonna throw away servers every year only every three years, um, which is really, really bad, especially you will learn something later why this is a bad idea. There's a nice picture here from a Canadian mining lobbying company that are very proud to show you that a phone contains all these rare earths and metals, right? But for example, tungsten, there is not that much on this planet. Eh? This is not, we, we often treat digital stuff, we just build more, it's infinite. Most of the stuff we need to make these things is the opposite of infinite. It's very rare, very hard to get, and very limited supply on this earth, right? Of course, we're gonna mine the moon, so don't worry, right? And if we don't mine the moon, we just mine Jupiter or something. Um, but I'm just telling you that this is not infinite, and we need this also for solving almost every other problem in our energy system, for example, like uh, wind turbines. Uh, if we want to reach our renewable energy targets, we need to use, I think, what was it? I think one third of the world's copper needs to go into wind turbines. Just to uh, give you an idea. We need this stuff for other stuff. Um, I deliberately choose not to show you a picture of children mining cobalt, but I say it anyway, so I just show you a mine. The environmental consequence of mining don't happen in Barcelona. They don't even happen in Spain. They happen everywhere else, and it's very hard to see and get a feel for it. But Google like a lithium lake, um, and you will see the different colors or the chemicals, and there's people standing in those chemicals with naked feet. Um, ideally, I'm, I'm not saying we should all feel guilty for having this. Don't, right? Don't, don't go there. Uh, but what I'm saying is let's just try to use it as long as we can, and let's say, make sure that we don't make software that forces people to throw it away. Right? That's that's maybe a good message. Now, the other ironic thing, I was get a bit funnier, sorry, get a bit lighter again. Uh, the mining part is always hard. Um, this is the part that we, a lot of people also in society forget, is that um, most digital resources need to be made somewhere. And these are referred to as data centers. I don't know why, but uh, they're more like dig digital resource power plants or digital power plants, you could say. They're gigantic. This is one of Meta, uh, sorry for the bashing, to all the people from Meta. Um, it's in the desert. Um, and why this is interesting is, so first of all, why would you build a data center in the desert? I don't know. Um, I, probably tax incentives. Uh, but what's interesting about this, this thing needs a lot of water for cooling because in the desert it gets very hot. So you use water to actually spray into the, into the fans to re reduce your energy consumption. Um, and the problem with this is not that they're using water or that it's per se in the desert, but they have secured water rights that are above humans. So when the river nearby runs out of water in summer, the city has to turn off the water for the people, but this data center still gets water. Right? And that's because the digital world requires 100% reliability, availability, and uptime. And now we could ask the question, but we don't want to go there. Does Facebook need to be, if it's down, is it really that bad? that people should have, that there's the choice, like people could drink water or we have Facebook. I don't know, it's up to you to decide. Um, the, another picture, again, it's just more as an illustration. This is a part of London, it's called Slough. It's not a very cool part. There's a little power plant here, maybe to give you an idea of scale, right? This is the power plant. And everything white essentially is a data center. 
right? This is an entire city. It's about a gigawatt. So I think Barcelona's energy consumption is probably less than a gigawatt. So this is more energy than Barcelona, it's my guess. Um, and most of the data centers usually cluster, which from a security and resilience perspective, yeah, it's also not very smart. Um, but we, they, they, from the outside, they look like warehouses and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, but they're there. And every time you click a, start a VM in one of the cloud environments, this is where it goes. Um, now, in this idea of like extending the lifetime of this, right? Um, we, a lot of people used to replace computers because they get faster. And I think if you witness now the change from an Intel i7 to where we are now over the last 10 years, you probably all know that it didn't really get that much faster anymore. I don't need to, you don't need to look at science. You can just feel like, yes, I'm buying a new computer, but is it really faster? N no, not, not so much. The, the, the difference is, uh, is not there anymore. And that's because at three nanometers is where we're at these days with chips, you can't get much smaller because the electrons don't fit, it's too tiny. So um, that you can't make chips any smaller. So what do you do? You make them bigger. And if you look at a, a, a GPU today, the most debated thing for, for training uh, AI models, um, it's just a gigantic CPU. Uh, it, it squeezes out so much more computation because it's bigger and it uses so much more power. It's 6,500 watts for an A100, which is uh, a lot more than your toaster, that's for sure. It's six and a half thousand. Uh, toaster has five. It's about 13,000 toasters running at the same time. Also generating the same amount of heat as the, those toasters, by the way. Um, and chips are not getting faster, so we don't need to constantly upgrade these machines. Right? That hurts the business model of HP, Dell, Apple, because they really need you to buy a new computer every three years. But um, technically, it's not necessary. And now is the time to stop with, um, so to say, constantly refreshing servers, refreshing computers. Good. Now this is the more physical part. Now to the software part. Um, your choices, and that's why it's important that you're here, and that's I'm so happy that you're here, that you're listening to me. Um, choices make a difference. Right when building software. Um, here's a funny one again, hopefully, for you. Who uses Windows in the room? Oh, more than I thought. Okay. Um, this is how, uh, and Mims asked me a good question earlier, like, why is this like this? But Windows has had an increase of lines of code over the years that's quite significant to up to 50 million lines of code. It's a very maintainable piece of software, I'm sure. Um, and I think this bump comes from the introduction from .NET, but somebody can in, uh, tell, me, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but what's more interesting, when the lines of code increased, it also increased the minimum required amount of memory and compute that Windows asked for. So every time they made a new Windows version, you essentially could throw away the laptop you had. You had to get a new one just to run the latest Windows. And that's, it's a choice, right? It's a choice that whoever made this piece of software had, uh, they, and they choose to just, oops, they choose to just increase, say, we need more uh, digital resources. We could have made it made maybe better software, but we choose to just ask for more resources. Um, another good example of choices is, um, and, and it's a, I, I usually use my mom's cooking block, which she doesn't have, it's just an example. Um, there's a lot of websites out there that are nobody's using anymore or forgot about or is not maintaining or is running stuff that nobody actually wants anymore or needs anymore. And ironically, it runs on infrastructure of this, the quality of a bank. So most of it runs on data centers that have diesel generators, backup power, very, very expensive, very sophisticated infrastructure to run like WordPress blocks with recipes on it. And I, I wonder, it's again, it's about choices, right? We could do it differently, but we choose to just put it all on the same infrastructure. And the question is, is that necessary? Can we remove them? Can we clean stuff? Um, that's the other question. Um, the, the third um, thing that I talk a lot about, um, because once you really dig into sustainability, and don't worry, we're going to dig much deeper later, um, you are going to find this, which is Javon's paradox, or the rebound effect which is, um, this joke explains better than me, the idea is always, okay, we make cars more fuel efficient, we as a society are gonna use less fuel. 
right? That's the idea. Fuel efficient cars, less fuel. Actually, though, science has shown, and over and over again with every industrial cycle, if you make something more efficient, people just drive more. And that's called Javon's paradox that we expect it to go down, but actually the total goes up. And if you think about the introduction of cloud, what happened? The idea was cloud is more efficient, or probably is. We'll talk about that later. Um, but it just led to people building more software. Right? So like the total amount of software has just increased. And that's the rebound effect. That's why you will never really hear me talk about efficiency, because efficiency is not a good thing to pursue. It leads to always more consumption, unfortunately. Um, another good example of choices is in, in, German, we, in Germany, we, we used to say that you throw more metal at the problem. Uh, I don't know if that translates well into English, but this sums it up. This is where Google and I agree. You can't just throw servers at a technical problem. If something is not performing well, it's a choice to solve it by thinking hard and uh, solving it, or just to say, let's like, just add 400 more machines. Right? That's a choice. It's a very simple one. Um, last example, scale. Um, there was also MIMS idea, always pointing at you now, um, is um, the question always, do I need to optimize these three lines of code? Is it really worth it? It depends on the scale. If you write a library where one billion other libraries depend on your library, yes, then those three lines of code have a significant potential impact in terms of energy and resource use. It's massive. It's the same if you build an application or an API or something that gets queried like a billion times. Yes, like a 0.1% improvement is huge. But if you only have 10 users, not so much. Right? So Scale is really, what I said earlier, the size of audience really, really matters. Um, good. Sorry, that was all the examples. And don't worry, it's going to get deeper after I split you. Um, what's expected of you as a, as a community of people that make digital products, for which we should come up with a good word, by the way? Because it's not, you can't say software engineers, there's product managers here, there's designers, there's UX people. Um, Acknowledge it. So just say, I understand it. I get it. I, I acknowledge it. I, I know that digital resources create environmental impact. Um, that's helpful already, that we just don't have that conversation anymore, that we just say, yes, it's true. It's, that's how it is. Um, the second one is responsibility. Uh, we talk about that later as well. Again, um, it's very easy to say, because people use my product, it's their fault, right? Because people fly, uh, they should feel guilty that they're flying. But the question, the, in, in reality, it's always the person that puts the product into the market who has the responsibility of making sure it has a, a limited environmental and social impact. Uh, it's not the person buying it. That's a very old uh, game that the tobacco industry, the oil industry have played very well, that we always feel guilty for buying products. But it's, if you make, sell me a product that has a very bad environmental impact, it's not my fault. It's the fault of the person making the product. Um, and so I urge you to think about how you can take responsibility for the products that you put into the market. Not, don't feel guilty. Just think about it. Um, the third one where you can help me a lot is talk to people about it. Right? Go into your companies. Go at other meetups. Um, go do this presentation yourself. I'm happy to share you all the slides, all the, everything we've ever done. It's all there. It's all free. Um, just repeat it. Say it over and over again. I think these pictures in the beginning, for example, they're very important to get people to, to think about environmental impact. Um, the fourth one um, is also important because I think um, in a lot of ways in digital products, we compete around features. And what would be much more helpful is to compete around who has the least amount of environmental impact, for example. But that requires transparency. So that requires that if, if you make a web app uh, that it says really clearly like how much environmental impact this web app creates and that starts a competition because if you make it public, then other people will make it public and then their numbers are worse than your numbers and then they will start improving things and that, that helps a lot, this, uh, this transparency piece. Um, and that's also what we work on a lot. Good, that was what you can do. Now to today. 
you made it to the introduction. Any questions, by the way, or like people would want to? Yeah, it's in that sense, it probably didn't get my message across very well. Um, thank you. Um, the message is more: let's clean up what we don't need anymore, because it wasn't it wasn't meant that if if a hobby if a non technical person builds a WordPress site, they they are not aware of what they're doing in terms of environmental impact, and their transparency helps. Showing them, you click this button, this creates this much impact. But my message was more towards the product community: let's also remove things, right? Um, you you told me this word uh, unshipping things, for example. Also removing things. If we if a startup fails, you know, actually deleting all the code and all the packages that have been uploaded everywhere. Um, just really like a culture of removing things. Um, that was the main message. I think that's a really good one. I've believed in that for a long time that you can basically say, hey, my server, you know, if you need to turn it off, that's fine. I don't care. Yeah. But today the market does not give the product like this. Like you cannot buy virtual machines that have no reliability. They all come with this 99.9999% reliability, but the market uh, needs to offer it. It will only offer it if we ask for it. That's the, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> for the for the technical details that I will explain comes in a second uh, how we then actually solve it. Um, okay, today uh, two tracks. So you have two, you can either stay with me or you can go with Mims. That's why you I mentioned Mims so much that you know who he is. Now you know who he is. Um, the idea is simple. If you've never touched this topic before, then listening to me is probably a good idea. So staying here because I will go with you explaining it and discussing it with you and really getting started on the sustainability journey in that sense. Um, if you've already touched this topic before, so if you read about it or have you read a book about it or you've been in some other community around it, then it's better to go with Mims because there we're gonna do, uh, he's gonna do much more interactive. Let's think about what, how to turn off that WordPress site. Like how do we get rid of those um, and like really make it practical. Um, it helps us a lot, that second part, because we document it all in public in our wiki. Um, so we will, everything you come up with today, we will actually document and verify it and then uh, make it uh, public knowledge. Um, so feel free to go with MIMS if you want. Um, but it's more, uh, the expectation is that you already know about this a bit. So maybe some ha hands who wants to stay here? Yeah, who wants to go workshopping? Great. Then... Uh, that's cool. Um, I need to laugh a bit more. Can you help me laugh a bit more? Okay, so serious. Thank you. Um, I don't like serious things. I'm more like a clown. But like even when I do this, like uh, look at the minds and things like this, I even I I get this like um, negative feeling, and I don't want you to get that feeling. It's not about feeling guilty. It's we can fix it because we, that's the irony as software engineers and product people. We have so much power, right? 
No, really, like we have so much power. We we choose which open source components we use. We choose, we kind of dictate how much servers we need. We dictate how which cloud providers we use, what technologies we want to use. We have so much power. Right? So like I don't feel guilty, feel encouraged, like, yeah, we can fix this. That's the message. Sorry, that had to be said. Um we do a break at 3.15 for coffee and uh, some snacks and some food. Um, and then at 5, we stop. But we don't stop. We drink. We eat more. Drink, I mean, alcoholic and non-alcoholic things. Um, and we are here until 8. So if you want to, between 5 and uh, 8, we just get to chat and just hang out if you want. If you don't, it's also okay. Um, that's the plan. Any questions? <laughs> Should we clap? No clap? Cool. So if you want to go workshopping, MIMS is going. Follow MIMS. And if you have any questions, by the way, and also because I said Isidro, I mentioned him earlier, and I said thank you to him even though he wasn't here, that's Isidro. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also for this room, if you want water, something is always behind you, so don't be don't be shy. I'll wait a bit. So maybe some like a useful uh, rule, interrupt me, shout at me, laugh at me, react at me, right? It's no problem. You cannot throw me off track. I've done this so many times that it's impossible. I will always get back in. It's no problem. We can stop anywhere and I will stop also in between to ask you a bit of questions. Um, we can stop anywhere and just, we can go wide, low, uh, on each topic, don't be don't be afraid to ask. There's, uh, I've heard a lot of strange questions before, and there are no, there is always an answer, or at least I can point you at somebody who can maybe who has the information that you're looking for, um, or we can make it more specific. Yeah, don't be shy. Um, I wait for the. Come back. So the first, before I start explaining it to you, I'm just curious, like, what's your current view, idea, perspective on, on sustainability? What is it to you? Whatever you want.
Ja. Was? Okay. Nice. I'm hyped about it. <lacht> ja. Ja. Sustainable Development. Ja. It's nature. Okay. Interesting. Ja. Yeah. Also good. Anybody else? Yeah. So this, if you can see it. Yeah, good. See, I don't need to do the presentation. Uh, you are helping me already. Yeah, that's, um, so sustainability has a lot of different, actually it's not a fixed term that has a fixed meaning. There's a lot of different scientists who have looked at it in different ways. One way is the, the three circles, which is making everything equal. So we need to balance environment, economic, and social. Then somebody said, actually, economic is more important than all the others, so we do it like this. Then somebody said, oh, sustainability is the roof and the environmental social exist in all forms, but it's about finding balance. That's the message. It just doesn't mean we need to sacrifice everything. We cannot, money is bad and we just need to do environmentalism. Uh, it's about balancing all three. Um, now, the other thing I heard was the next generation piece. That's another, it comes out of a report from the United Nations called Our Common Future, which was actually um, uh, released, I think, like 19, I forgot now, 1985 or so, or 19, pretty long ago. And it introduced this whole concept of how do we develop our society, both economic um, and from, like, how do we develop as a, as a, as a species, so to say, without in a way that we don't damage the planet for the next generation that whole idea came out of that report it's a very long document um, but and it also gave birth to the sdgs that i didn't put on here i'm sure you've seen them now um, which have been slapped onto everything now but i really if you're really curious i can say that the way they thought about this is very like it's very thought through if you really actually read it and um, dive into it um, it's fascinating how they imagined this. Um, and there is also, did I put it on a slide? No. Um, there is um, two concepts in here, um, which is the needs, which is basically for the first time defining like, what do we actually like, yeah, how, how do I say this? How, what do we actually need as a society? And it also defines in the report that the needs of some people on this planet are higher at the moment than for example here, right? Like our needs, we have food, we have water, we have electricity, we have a lot of good stuff, right? But the needs need to be leveled so that we're all on the same level. And that's part of sustainable development is also equalizing. Yeah? Um, good, but I won't spend so much time on this. Then there is a third con uh, concept which is more related to climate. And again, sustainability does not necessarily be linked to climate. It doesn't have to be. You don't have to believe in climate change to, to practice sustainability. Um, mm -hmm. Though it works, it helps. Um, and that's the planetary boundaries. Maybe you heard of those. It, it basically is the so Stockholm Center of Resilience made a, uh, a circle of how much resources we extract from the world, how much carbon we um, we emit. And the green circle is where we should be in if we don't want to hurt the next generation. And you can imagine what the other parts mean. That's where we're actually at. And on, mo on most of these, um, uh, in the latest report, I think we are overshooting almost all of them. So we're past uh, the, the turning point. Um, again, not to make you feel bad, it's just, it's just scientific fact. This is how it is. Um, yeah, uh, that's another helpful tool. Yeah, unfortunately, the uh, stratospheric ozone depletion, because actually, remember when we started having ozone holes because of the, the, the gases in the, in the sprays, we immediately banned those gases and actually ozone depletion went backwards. So that's, uh, that's a good one. Uh, oceanic acidification is this one. So that's almost at overshoot. So it's like dumping trash into the ocean, plastics, blah. 
also helps acidify them. Plus, if you look at how much chemicals are being pumped into the ocean, you know why they're being acidified. Um, but also carbon. So actually, if you really want to get into climate science, the oceans are the largest absorber of um, carbon emissions. But if they absorb more, they become more acidic. So um, just like trees, the oceans can absorb um, carbon, and that's. But there is a. It's all about balance. Everything in nature is about like not doing too much of one thing, right? If you eat fries every day, that's not good for you. But if you eat fries together with like vegetables and with some other things, fruit together, then it's kind of okay. Uh, it's balance, right? And the whole discipline of sustainability is really finding balance. Yeah. Cool. Any questions on this? Again, don't have to believe in climate to practice this. Okay. Cool. So I, again, I, I was hoping I didn't. I can make the sustainability part a lot bigger, but I, I hope that you all uh, get the principles of it. Um, now, what's the problem? Um, now, some graphs. Um, despite the fact that we always hear these claims that everything is getting more efficient, the actual and energy is always a good proxy. So I'm going to use sometimes energy as a, but don't just think about energy, um, is actually going up. So if you consumer devices is relatively stable, uh, but if you look at everything that, because today's uh, consumer devices outsource a lot of the computation to um, remote data centers or to the cloud or to a virtual machine somewhere. So a lot of stuff doesn't happen on the consumer device. Think about most laptops you use today, you basically only use the browser, which means that the computation is outsourced here, right? Uh, and that makes it very, like this gets lighter and battery lasts longer and you're like, wow, it's amazing. But actually you're just outsourcing the problem into an invisible cloud. Um, again, I explained this earlier with, with scale. Uh, this is another uh, good example if you, um, if you spend 500 developers um, to optimize 10 transactions on an application that has 1.5 million users and each transaction uses 10 watts per second, it's a bit technical, then your total energy savings equals about uh, 30,000 households. Uh, it's, you optimize like one second of speed, essentially, and the outcome is potential savings of 30,000 single households. Um, so again, if you have, if you work on big software projects or big applications, um, even with just 50,000 users, the scale effects are enormous. Uh, um, keep that in mind. So that's part of the problems. But before I go more into problems, I need to also teach you some stuff that you hear a lot around sustainability and tech, especially that um, are counterintuitive to what I'm trying to explain to you today. Um, first one, uh, we talked about this in the beginning. Um, you hear this a lot, again, in oil and gas and tobacco as well. Um, if you are smoking and tobacco is hurting you, that's your fault. That's a narrative really created by a PR agency for British Petroleum 20 years ago. The idea of an individual carbon footprint so that each of you runs around and makes a CO2 assessment. That's an invention of a PR agency. It is not your fault. It is always the fact that if, if, if somebody puts a product in the market with an environmental impact or that hurts your, your lungs or your, the society, it's the company's fault. And the company needs to be accountable for that, right? Uh, not, not the individual. Yeah. Yes. To a certain extent, so again, if you, let's say you have an oven at home, an electric oven, and you open it, and you leave it, you turn it on to the highest temperature, and then you go do your groceries for two hours, so you're heating your house with your oven, that's, uh, I would say, unsustainable use, right? And we laugh about it, but I think there is a certain, you need to, you can expect a certain level of um, responsibility also from the consumer, but if you're making an oven that by design, 10, let's say 10% 10 of the energy that goes in just evaporates somehow because of an engineering mistake, that's not the consumer's fault, right? Yeah, but this is where regulation comes in, 
So the so the government decides what can be sold into a market and what not. And for example, Yeah, because for doing it for sustainability is a lot more complicated than just for energy use. But yes, energy labels work and they are very effective in that, especially because a lot of people don't know that if you buy a TV now that has an A, two years from now, that's an F. Because the EU every two years raises the bar again and again and again, because the companies need to get better and better and better and better. Um, but it only works through regulation. Huh? There's no, no company goes like, oh, let's make the most efficient TV on earth. Nobody cares. Um, and so the customer has a certain responsibility, but I would actually argue that if you are a consumer of these devices, your responsibility is rather to go to your politician and say, I want you to make sure that these things are made only from recycled metals. I don't want anything to come from a mine with children in it. Yeah? That's your responsibility to express that to the government to enforce those rules. That's a very foreign concept for a lot of people in the US because they're not really into regulation, but in Europe, that's the way it goes. We say what we want, we make a rule, and then the companies change the products. And that's how a democracy works. And we still have one, so at least in principle. But I can tell you it, it does work. We, I, I, I spent five years lobbying on data centers in, in Europe and if you look at the latest European regulation on data centers, um, they implemented everything we demanded. And they ignored everything that the lobbyists said. It's not a problem. They will listen, but we have to say what we want. And we have to express it in a way that a politician can understand it. Uh, that's another way. Um, in what way do you mean? Yeah, if everybody at BP would quit, there would be... Yeah, but that's really, that's a, like a democracy, right? If nobody votes anymore to work at the company, then it falls apart. A company is also just pe people. Yeah. Um, okay. But to these two layers, which I think are more under our control today. Um, so if I build a digital product, my responsibility is to minimize how many resources it needs. One to be transparent about how many resources it needs so that people who use it know that... Actually, I can tell you, for example, with Apple, they're not very transparent. I have no clue how much aluminum is in here. I can guess. I also don't know how much energy it consumes, but I can put an energy meter here and measure it. I don't know how much tungsten is it. I have no clue because Apple chooses not to make any of this information public. Neither does HP or Dell or anybody else. Um, so transparency is the second one. And I really mean that on a product level. So if you have a product like Asana, um, I think every user that uses Asana should know how much their account is worth in environmental impact. Yeah? And I think that's the responsibility of people who make digital products to, to have that on the door, so to say. Car manufacturers were forced to do this. That's why we, have, we know how much fuel a car needs to drive 100 kilometers. There's rules that they have to say this. They wouldn't have done it voluntarily. That's why we lobby a lot for this to be mandatory. Um, and the, the third one is procurement. So if I make a digital product, I choose a provider of digital resources. That can be cloud, that can be a local data center provider, can be a hosting company. And by choosing one that makes sustainable digital resources, I also can make a difference. There are hosters, for example, that use only refurbished hardware. So. I do have a choice also through my purchasing power. Right? Um, the next layer, those people are not here, but if you run a hosting company um, or you run a cloud, then you your job is to avoid any wastage of digital resources. So even, and a lot of do that with virtualization, that if you are not using your virtual machine, they're actually giving it to somebody else without you knowing. Um, so they're avoiding waste, but they also, need to tell you exactly how much environmental impact is in what you're buying. So if you're buying a virtual machine, 
that should come with environmental impact information. That today is not the case. But again, I said earlier, you have all the power. Literally, if you go look at like, who is our cloud provider? Who's our hosting company? And you just send them an email and they say, can you send me the environmental impact information of what we're using? Then they go like, oh shit, <laughs> right? And that alone creates change. And that's why I say always, you have all the power. Yeah. Cool, responsibility. Um, that was, I have to count, I didn't forget. That was myth number one, we have to speed up. Uh, myth number two, it's all about energy. It's not. Um, we did a research project a long time ago with, the, um, with a lot of researchers at, in London and um, in France and in Germany. And we looked, we disassembled the server. I showed you the picture earlier. And we said, okay, so how much of this environmental impact is the server versus the power that goes in? And it's actually half and half. Over a lifetime of five years, the energy is, so to say, as bad as just the, man the whole manufacturing of this. But when you look at HPs, so you see here, these are from HP. That doesn't say for good reason, but normally I can tell you it's HP and Dell. They always say, no, 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 don't worry about the, don't worry about the manufacturing, guys. You just have to worry about the energy consumption. And why do they say that? Because that's your fault, right? If I'm plugging this into energy, if I use it, it consumes energy. So they're essentially saying again, it's the user's fault. Um, so don't fall for that. That's why I'm telling you, myth. Not true. Number three, the, probably the most well-known one, Max. Don't worry about it. It's all green energy. First of all, when you hear that, remember that. It's not just about energy. Second one is, yes, that's, a, that's actually true. So most of the tech companies in the world and cloud providers are the largest purchasers of green electrons on this planet by far. These are the top buyers, and you can, I don't know if you can read it, but Amazon, TSMC, chip manufacturer, Verizon, Facebook, AT&T, Microsoft. So 60% of this list is just tech. Now, here's the problem with this. Um, the first one, the first problem is we actually need that green energy for everything else as well. So heating your houses in Barcelona, not with gas, but with electricity, needs electricity, green one. Making steel green requires electricity. We are about to electrify everything. Electric cars, everything needs green energy. And what these guys are essentially doing, they're saying, ah, we take it all first so that nobody else can take it from us. And most of the companies buy more than they need because they want to be able to claim that at any given time, anywhere in the world, it was running somewhere on green energy. That's the first problem with this. The second problem is if there's some people here in the room that understand physics, I don't know if you've ever tried to see a green electron go through this cable, where it, like, you know, this electron comes out of the wind park and you say like, go there to my data center. That's not how physics work. So the only green energy that matters is if it comes out of a, let's say, 50 to 100 kilometer radius around this building. Otherwise, it's physically very unlikely that it ever made it here. Yeah? Good example, uh, a lot of people still buy certificates. So you buy a green energy in Norway and you use it in Barcelona. It's a bit far-fetched, I would say. Uh, um, so first of all, it's not just about energy. Second one, I would, for the moment, I would just say, ignore if it's green or gray. It's, it's a nice marketing play, but it's not really helpful because at the end of the day, we have to reduce energy consumption. This is all about saying, we can have massive growth by just greening it, but that ultimately we need to spend time figuring, through figuring out how to reduce energy use and not just greening it. Um, so that's myth number three, I think. This one, I don't know how many times I had to argue this one. The cloud is more efficient. Maybe. Where is the data to prove it? Have you ever seen a report by a scientific independent party showing you how much more efficient the cloud is versus something else by, again, very important, a paper that was not written by a consultancy or by a, the firms themselves. This is a very nice statement based on the theory of if you virtualize resources and you share them all, it's much more efficient. Yes, that's logically true, but I have learned in this sector to only believe what I see. 
And I've never seen, for example, the utilization rate of a cloud data center to this day. I've actually very few people have ever been in one, right? Very few people who work there are allowed to talk about anything they do there. So this is a very good sales argument to move everything in the world into cloud. But if you um, think about it like this, let's say are the people from Airbus, no, they went over there. Uh, if Airbus moves a data center um, from Toulouse to the cloud, really think through what really happens. So you had a data center there with 10,000 servers. That was there. It was working. It's fine. Now, migrating doesn't mean we are moving the 10,000 servers to the cloud. It means we're moving the applications to the cloud. So what really happens is 10,000 servers stay there. They don't get recycled or reused. And Microsoft, AWS, whoever, buys 10,000 new servers so that you can put it into the cloud. Yeah, But it's complete. It, it doubles the resource use, first and foremost. Right? I'm not saying that the cloud is not cool and useful and very convenient. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying is efficiency is, is not the same as effectiveness in that sense. Yeah. Um, Cool. Any questions so far on these myths, by the way? I hope they help because I just need to give you a counter narrative to like all these narratives that are out there. Yeah. This is another one. Um, this is a great picture by a researcher. So, carbon, carbon, carbon. You also, there's a lot of efforts in the software world to like shift applications based on the carbon intensity of the grid from there to there or where the sun is shining and all this stuff. But to be really honest, like this obsession with carbon comes, of course, from a reporting requirement, which is the GHG protocol that you have to report scope one, two, and three um, emissions. Um, but if you just optimize emissions and you, it's the same as just optimizing energy, you are doing it often at the cost uh, of something else. And that's why sustainability is about balance. Right? Not about carbon. Right? Also, climate is not just about carbon. If you acidify the oceans, they turn, you kill everything that's in the ocean, then the carbon gets released. Right? If your world gets too hot, the trees bur start burning, you release all the carbon as well. So it's all about finding equilibrium uh, and, and balance. Um, a good example of this in, in tech is that if you want to optimize the energy consumption of a sorry, it's very technical, of a data center, um, you'd use water. You spray water into, the, into, these, into these fans. Literally, like it, it sounds very sophisticated when they say it's an adiabatic cooling system. But this means you take a garden hose and you spray cold water into this fan while it sucks in air because the, the water cools the air. And afterwards, the water just evaporates and makes clouds. Um, and if you do that in the desert, that's not so fun. Right? But it reduces the energy consumption. It's more efficient. Um, yeah, And the same with carbon. If you focus only on that, um, you get very quickly to offsets and to things that are, don't make any sense. Um, this one, what it means? I don't remember, to be really honest. It's like the, the list is actually even longer. There's, if you look at the life cycle assessment, the, the, the ways you can destroy the environment, there's like 28 different indicators and eutrophication is either, it's poisoning something, but I don't remember if it's uh, water or air, um, but it's usually about toxic, toxicity. Um, it's a bit like, yeah, this ecotoxicity, this, um, same as pollution, those fall in the same bucket. But I, I would have to look it up as well. A lot of complicated words in environmental science. Can't, can't remember it all. Questions on this? Don't worry, I'm almost done with my like counter-narrative game. Um, reports by cloud providers, um, same thing. You get a lot of... Um, Essentially, you will get now, you will, in the next couple of years from every tech company, you get some kind of report. Um, if you talk to the people from Airbus later, ask them about the reports they get because they very, get very large reports and none of them make sense. None of them are comparable. 
And the most important thing is we don't know the underlying methodology. We don't know under underlying assumptions. We have to be very careful with consuming, consuming sustainability reports from companies who benefit from more consumption is always very tricky. Yeah. Uh, to, to put that in perspective, I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, there was a report by the British regulator uh, on cloud. For every dollar you spend on AWS, AWS makes on average 42% profit. Profit, not revenue, profit. Why would they give you a report that says, hey man, you're consuming too much? Like really like, sometimes we have to think about incentives and disincentives and um, this makes, it makes no sense. Cool. Now before now we're going to go deep. Anything that I need to want do you want me to ask answer beforehand on sustainability, less technical stuff, more philosophical questions. Uh, does this make sense so far? Okay, is it interesting? Okay, I also need to look at time. Okay. Um, has anybody here tried to measure something in this space before? How did you do it? <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pro yeah. That's a so it's a good starting point. I there is no reliable way to measure anything at the moment. This is everything I'm going to tell you today is about educated guessing. That's how I call it. And that's a regulatory what's like it's a it's a regulatory problem because what you said that this information is not available is simply it it needs to be enforced. Um that it is available and consistent. Yeah, I, but it's not there yet. <laughs> Um, first behind uh, the, the gentleman, then the lady. Yes, yeah, but you... Yeah, but for example, that's a, like in in I will talk about this in a sec. But we have outsourced a lot in tech, right? So at the end of the day, if you build software today, you sit in front of something like this, and everything else happens somewhere else. And they have sensors, but they won't give you the information. And why the question is why? Why can't I access that the truth, so to say? Right? But I. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, it's a good, uh, good point. Do you want to add something? Yeah. That, yeah. The, the, what is so annoying with these statistics is that there's no way to prove or disprove them. And that's the bit, uh, um, I think it's, I know the statistic, I think it's a bit high. But I, I do think um, yeah, it's it's sad that we don't know the real the real answer uh, in that sense. In in theory, in theory, yes. Uh, and for example, I, so we've tried this um, many times. And then for even easier example, a photo on Instagram. Right? It's, let's say it's a megabyte. It needs to be stored somewhere. It needs to be transferred. You should be able to calculate it. Now, I know some people that work at Meta are responsible for infrastructure. They're like, like first of all, we replicate the picture 70 times. We make 70 copies of the picture. Then we put it, push it to our CDN partners, Akamai, Cloudflare and others, so that we have multiple cache nodes available everywhere so that the picture loads in like near instantaneously. Now, already, if you add all that up, that becomes like, in, that, that means that there's like 40 data centers involved to deliver one picture, uh, hundreds of servers, storage arrays, and it becomes like so complicated. Well, it would be much easier if Instagram would take its whole own energy consumption, which we don't know, and divides it by the number of pictures on the platform. That takes 10 minutes to do, but we don't know how many pictures there are, nor do we know the total energy consumption, because all of that is secret. And so these simple mathematical equations that you can run, we can't, because the base data is always missing. Sorry, how they pose? Yeah. I. Being a software engineer myself, I'm pretty sure it's a new object in the database and they probably make a copy of the photo just to be sure. Yes, I, I'm sure. Um, it's the, the problem is we don't know. We cannot see behind this facade. I always try to, when I talk to policy people, I say it's like a building you can't go into. So I'll give you another example. Let's say um, we pass a law that says Google needs to organize the search results differently. Uh, we pass it 10 minutes later, the Google CEO comes to you and is like, yeah, we did it. Um, and you're like, okay, can you show me? And he's like, no, that's intellectual property. I cannot show you how we rank our results. I cannot show you that. I'm like, just trust me. But technically, they could have done nothing, and we wouldn't know. And this is the, one of the fundamental problems with the digital sector as a whole. And it started, I also do some anthropology research often, um, and it started with this... Um, with the, the culture of tech of secrecy. And it has, I don't think it's on purpose that we don't have this information, it's just the default. The default is, if you look at the financial reports of most tech companies, even there you find nothing. The, I have to give Microsoft a lot of credit, they release sustainability reports that really show that they're carbon, they want to be carbon negative by, 2020, uh, by 2030 or something, and they're going the exact opposite way. And in the sustainability report, it says really fat, like in bold, um, we don't know how to solve this. That's great. Like that's that's transparency that I can work with. But the rest of the company is more like, no, no, we we got it. Can I see it? No. <laughs> um, and then the other.
Yes. But I, I think that transparency you only get with a, with a stick. I think the um, the carrot uh, doesn't work. Um, there's though the open source is a great uh, keyword. I think when I don't know you, you probably never think about it, but I have too much time, so I think about these things. Have you ever thought about what the open source license agreement actually means? Because it always says zero liability for I wrote a database, and if something goes wrong, I'm not liable. And that makes sense because I put it out in the open. I don't know what happens with it, but it's a denial of responsibility. And so, for example, a lot of people always say, yeah, Max, like how sustainable software must be open source. I, and I say like not per se, but sustainable software must come from people who feel responsible for the outcomes of the software they produce. And that an open source can be somebody say, look, we make TensorFlow or we make like a really big database and we care about the environmental impact. So actually we put in the license, not uh, we have no liability, but we also put whoever is using it needs to make transparent how much energy it uses. Could be one sentence in the license would change everything. Yeah. have had many debates though with open source people. They're not so open to change the license. <laughs> um, but But it's so much about, it's really about like, tiny little changes in mindset and taking responsibility. It's not so much technical. Though, don't worry, now comes the technical part. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true, but I, I know for a fact that most people that run very large infrastructure in IT have monitoring system. I mean, we're sitting in a company that sells monitoring systems, look at the size of the company right? and where they're sitting and how they're stock listed. So the data is there. And if you ask Dynatrace, they show you from like almost every company. It's just that it's not, it's not released to the public in that sense. So I think it doesn't create overhead to your point. I would, I would, uh, I would think it's actually the level of detail is even higher than we need. Right? There's uh, in 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 the infrastructure that I have worked in, uh, we had log files for every system, billions of lines generated per second, terabytes of log files for every part of the application. Every every API point was monitored. How many requests go in? Like the data was there. No, but once you have those, the usage, once you know at least one part of the formula, you can do the rest mathematically. Uh, I w actually, I will show you how to do that with math. It's just math. Um, good. Should I go there? Okay. What are we measuring? Now, this goes to your point of uh, utilization also a bit, uh, which is not on here. There's, if you perform a life cycle assessment of a product, which is the environmental science of, um, that's standardized, it's ISO 14044. So if you have this pen, you perform a life cycle assessment, which basically looks at how much plastic is in here, where was it, how much, how much energy was used for manufacturing it, um, how much waste does this generate, and this is a very sophisticated process. And in that, you can choose what you're going to analyze. And there's 28 data points that one can analyze from global warming potential, so CO2 to energy use. And we selected out of those 28 the ones that we are the thing that are the most relevant for software and digital products. Um, and we put it in the frame of a, a food label, how you find it on food in the United States. Uh, because we also lobby this in the US, so it has to be Americanized. Um, 
So this looks like uh, ingredients from, from food, but that's also how you should think about it. If I make a video streaming product, such as YouTube, as was mentioned before, uh, then you could argue that the main function of my product is streaming video. And what I want to know as a user, if I use, if I stream one minute of video, what's the environmental impact? Yeah. Now, everybody here who's a product manager <laughs> will recognize that most digital products today have like 5,000 different functions. <laughs> so doing this for all of them is probably not useful, but doing one has to figure out what is the prime, the few primary functions of my product. Uh, is it like to, to, to add a task? Is it to do a video? Zoom's primary function is to do a video call, but it can also do 400 other things, right? Um, so f doing this for a primary function makes sense. And then you have these metrics. This one is carbon um, for manufacturing and also from energy after the here as well. This one, without going into detail what this metric means, because it's very, well, actually I do go. Um, Abiabatic resources are the ones that we take out of the planet and we cannot put them back. Yeah? Once, once copper is mined, you cannot return it. Right? Wood, you take it, it grows again. Yeah? So wood is not an abiot abiotic resource, but steel is, cobalt is, lithium is, uh, um, tungsten is, um, all those things we can never put back. So you can break that, and the, the same applies for gas and oil. Once you take it out of the ground, you cannot put it back. Therefore, you want to know how much of the world's resources did you deplete by making that product. Yeah, that's important. Uh, without that, if you just optimize for these two, you create an automatic rebound effect. Your product, video streaming, will get more and more efficient, which means that more people will stream more video, which is actually, you see this with YouTube today, people listen to music through videos, which is insane if you think about it. Uh, but it's a classic rebound effect. Um, you made it so fast, so efficient, so so easy and convenient. You reduce all the friction, and then it just skyrockets consumption, which is exactly why they do it, because they know that it will create a rebound effect. Uh, um, the um, Actually, in the case of Netflix, you can see what it costs to create a rebound effect, because the cost of making all this... So people, in, it's now so easy to watch to watch content on Netflix, that people want to watch more, so rebound. And then Netflix needs to pay 50 billion a year to make all this content because Google was smarter. They got people to make the content for free on YouTube. Right? So, but with Netflix, you really see the cost of a rebound effect in terms of what you need to keep investing into your machine to feed the people this, uh, what they want. Um, the next metric is energy use and ideally broken down into what's renewable, what's not renewable. So that's important for this, like, is it green energy claim that you can really see it? Fresh water, especially in the southern part of this planet, this will, there will be water wars. So we should really manage water. And the other one is, of course, uh, waste, uh, it, especially hazardous waste is, uh, includes electronic waste. So if you throw away uh, the motherboard in here, that's poisonous. It's toxic. Yeah. 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 Yes, but the entire digital economy is built on rebound effects. So if you if you really look at the majority of, that's why I said in the beginning, digital products, they don't often actually solve problems of society. They just find things that by making it more convenient and convenient being a proxy word for efficient, if you make it more convenient to consume something, you always increase consumption. If food delivery is a good example, Uber, like everything you increase the convenience, you assume like our, it's, our total consumption is going to go down, but the opposite happens. People just take more Ubers. Yes, it's all, it just, you, you increase scale. Yeah. Or you attach this because this is finite, right? So if you say, uh, you, could say you could pass a law, not a tax, but you could say 
we don't want to use more than 100 kilo of the world's tungsten on the digital economy, then this has a cap. Then all of a sudden, like everybody's going to optimize. But just this one, you can buy offsets, you can manipulate a lot, and you can get it to zero with no effort whatsoever. You need real physical things in here that are not infinite. Technically, carbon is infinite because we can make as much as we want. We just happen to die in the process, but um, but we can make more. First, the lady, because. Mm. Um, yes, I'm thinking of a better analogy. Um, I think what this becomes, and that's, I think, if you really think about your work and, and the digital economy, a lot of these things are utilities. So, for example, search, Google search, 98% market share. Can you imagine a society without search? Right? No. Okay. That means it's a utility. It's like imagine a society without water. Um, and utilities are heavily regulated because uh, an energy a utility should not incentivize you to use more water. That's not allowed. Uh, and you have a lot of transparency about um, how much water is there here in Barcelona, who is using how much, because utilities are basically often state owned. They're owned by us or you uh, heavily regulate them to make sure that they benefit everyone. Um, and I think we're going to get into this discussion, like which parts of the internet are actually utilities. Uh, they're life essential. We need them to work. They probably need to be state owned or heavily controlled. But um, also from a disinformation, there's more layers to this, but I think you're going to get into this utility thing and then everybody would pay like they pay for their power bill for the utility usage they produce, right? Um, which is then this uh, model that you suggested, I think, if I understood it correctly. Well, I'm, funny enough, you're already getting an internet bill, right? Yeah. So actually, we already build for usage of the digital economy. We just not build for the usage of digital utilities like search. But this gets into like really macroeconomics now. Sorry. <laughs> you also had a question. Yeah, human capacity, yeah, yeah, for sure. But God, luckily, we're adding more and more people to this planet, so we're never going to run out of people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the... the Yes and no. Um, so first of all, digital products we can consume a lot more of at a much lower friction. So we can, we technically you can have three, you can watch three streams at the same time, and people do. Uh, that's uh, um, it, 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 look at some uh, modern. Uh, uh, I have children, so look at your look at your kids. Um, the um, you would be surprised what how, how much consumption is still possible. 
There's still another problem with the digital economy, which you could say is very inefficient. Uh, it's always on. So actually, even if you're not watching, there's infrastructure running that makes it possible for you within everything that you do on, 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 an, on a phone, right? Is instantly available. I came up with this very funny analogy in a, in a political conversation that was, imagine you have somebody from Deliveroo or whatever it is in Barcelona, uh, some delivery uh, service, Uber Eats or something, and they're standing at your door like this the whole day with food. And you, you're, you're ordering, you open the app, you're ordering, and like it says immediately, like, food is here. You open the door, food is there. That's how the internet works. Everything is always on, and everything is always ready to like enable your consumption. And that's, from a resource perspective, completely insane. Not capitalism, per se. You can... Yeah, but that's that's like going from like here to there too fast. You even in capitalism you have regulated markets. And at the moment that everything you are building has no rules. There's no constraint, really. Like most of it like Yeah, but is that so so we are in Europe. Europe is not of we are not free market economies, we are social market economies. But we, we are like the masters of constraining everything. Like, this is what we do. I, I think like this idea of like, it's a free market. This is, no, I, my kids have US passports, so I'm not anti-American, right? But I'm just saying it's, a, it's an American value. It's not a European value. And I, my work is focuses entirely on, for, for now, at least on, on Europe. And I think f for Europe, this is, this is maybe, it's, it's not a fight for capitalism. It's just, what are the boundary conditions that we want to put in place? Right? Huh? No, no, they're not. Yeah, I, I know where you're going with this, but look, this is I do this full time. If 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 I would accept this, then I could like be like, yeah, fuck this. <laughs> so 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 I I have to say that there. I think that and honestly, even in the U.S., we work with two senators. They want to. They want to. Like the problem is rather that some of these companies are so big, they spend so much money on lobbying. It's very hard. It's they spend more than tobacco and oil. Huh? because they want to keep riding, and this hypergrowth is built on the back of massive amount of resource consumption. Like, F Meta used to throw away 1.2 million servers per year. Like, that's insane, really. And we don't see it because they, we have abstracted it away from, like, that we can actually touch it. Um, so this, this hypergrowth is fueled by unsustainable resource consumption. It's like driving a car that every moment, it can never turn off, it's always on, and it's always using gasoline and uses 100 liters to drive 10 meters. And now we have given, been given LLMs, so now we can, like, we, we got a Ford F100, so now it uses 200 liters for driving 10 centimeters. Yeah, all of this for the sake of, like, making life better. And then you ask most people, like, is your life better because of the digital products you use every day? And they're like, no. There was actually a study that in the US that they surveyed all students at major universities and they said, how much would you pay to turn off social media? And they said, on average, $50 a month, they would be willing to pay under the condition that it applies for, for everyone because they don't want to be the only ones. And that's the FOMO effect. But now we get into the, the, the values discussion of what software does. And that's exactly where I try not to go anymore because that's a really complicated, should TikTok exist, you know, like, that's a different discussion. That's really a societal values based. Do we want this or not? Yeah. Will it be most likely higher 
صحابي Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the the I agree with you. Like, for the, from the, citizens have, we people humans have in our society usually two roles. We are consumers, and we are citizens in a democracy. So. If every product in on this planet in our internet has this, like if ChatGPT had this for every every prompt for every query of an average length of blah, this is the environmental impact. Two things may happen: you can choose not to buy it, or you can be angry. Both things are fine with me. <laughs> huh? Yeah, but that's what I mean. You don't buy it, or you use it differently. Yes, same with a car. If you know it uses 100 liters to drive 100 meters, you might choose a different car, right? So transparency enables choice. And for me, it's fine if you all choose, like, actually, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. That's fine. But I think we would be angry if I would be able to show this to a million people. They would be very angry, and then we could vote about it, and we could change it. Or these, I'm, that, I doubt, because these things are very addictive and very useful, that I will get you all to stop using all of digital technology. Therefore, I'm hoping more on the anger. But transparency is the way either way. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's yeah. Now we're unfortunately lady left, but uh, um, uh, that's now liberal politics. So you can't, you can't people. But it's the same. You can't tell people to stop eating meat, but you can make people more aware of what it does. That's un that's. And to be honest, let's start here. If this doesn't work, we can still come up with something else. But that that's why um, I have the last three years. I went from like very detailed, like this is what we should be doing and all these hundred things. And this technically, this is how it works and then how we stop this. But I realized that transparency alone is the first step. Doesn't matter what we come up with afterwards. This is the step that we need to take first because to measure is to know. It's from uh, Lord Kelvin. Um, to measure, once we measured it, we can take action. You cannot win any political argument. You cannot persuade people if you don't have facts. And I... Personally, they want to live in a fact-based society, so I hope that, like, let's start with transparency. Yes. Yeah. And it's still a free market. Huh? Nobody goes like, oh, cigarettes are not a free market. It's still a free market. You can still make cigarettes, but the government has control over who can you sell it to. In the Netherlands, we forbid now uh, to sell it in supermarkets, for example. No cigarettes in supermarkets, which is very effective because then you can't buy it after at night. Um, Yeah. Yes. No. There is still, you want freedom. But look, we as the citizens get to decide when we give the government permission to take freedom away. Like if we all say, in, at least in a political handbook, um, and if we could, if 80% of citizens would agree that we want to have children under 14 not on TikTok, then we would have the same uh, sign-up process as a bank. You have to scan your passport, um, and then there would be no children on TikTok. Right? Then the parents can still, by the way, in a liberal market, 
um, the parents can still choose to override it because they're the parents uh, and we can do nothing about it. Um, but we can do changes. It's just we have power. But now we're in the political philosophical realm. Yeah, money, yeah. A uh, government is also just people, and we are just. Uh, we we are not so good in consequence thinking as a society. The, but first, him. Wait. Yes. So we're going to have people that think that may be dangerous for the environment, for their own health, or anything. Yep. And it's not that we're coming against the idea that this thing should exist or not. It's about the idea that it shouldn't be on either of the. Yes, correct. Um, and also, the idea that they don't smoke anymore cigarettes, they're going to go to alcohol. Those were the idea of you say carbon, carbon, carbon. Gonna focus on us only one problem and one metric. Yeah, you can say like they're gonna smoke either cigarettes or alcohol. Yeah, there's maybe correlation, a lot of points that are linked to one another. So yeah. there may be it's a bigger problem than only cigarettes that you can also address when you see that it's not cigarettes, it's alcohol. Well, maybe there's yep. another problem than cigarettes and alcohol. Yeah, I that's a very good. Uh good framing. I would even say that sustainability is the first real discipline of systems thinking, which is why it's so hard, because you need to think about so many different factors, things can can happen, and it's it's much more complicated than um, yeah most other things we've done before. Um, good. Now I keep going, also for time, um, because also otherwise we're going to be stuck in the tobacco alcohol discussion, and I don't want you to feel like Digital products are equal to tobacco. It's it's hopefully not that bad, but I don't know. Um, very little information on that. Um, now supply chains. So in order to measure something, it's again, I oversimplify these things because otherwise it's very hard to do systems thinking on a. If I make a diagram of eighty boxes, so we talked a lot about now the customer um, uh, before. I need to make a joke because we need to laugh a bit. Do you know what the drug trade and digital products have in common? Both call their customers users. Um, so I try not to worry, use the word user anymore. Um, anyways, there's a customer using a digital product. Um, that digital product, whoever, whatever company or entity that is, buys digital resources from a resource provider that can be cloud hosting, whatever. Um, and they in turn either buy or use digital infrastructure, which are data centers, fiber networks, you name it. Yeah? Um, that's, so to say, the supply chain. So most of you will be here, I hope. Um, you have a lot of power over these people, and they, in turn, have a lot of power over these people. That's the supply chain. Yeah. Um, so once you ask your cloud provider for an environmental impact footprint, they will call the data center and be like, hey, guys, we need this data now. And it will start driving change. That's why here is the power. And you have the power to show the customer what I showed you before, this, which gives you even power over their behavior. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm here talking to you and not anymore to these people. I started there, very bad people, or, sorry, very people reluctant to change. Put it like this. It's a lot of white men over 50. Um, good, measuring. Um, Little story. Um, think, I'm thinking about time. Okay, little story. Um, 
when I started working in tech, kind of the entire infrastructure of a software application or products back then was mostly online shops and websites look like this. You write some code. Back then, actually, you had if you bought a server and you drove it to a data center yourself and you installed it in a rack, put the cables in to the internet, and then you connected the first customer or user to that application. Yeah, there's somewhere a fiber network that was always there, um, but this was it. So I knew what the server was. I could access the server. I knew where the data center was. I probably know even the name of it. Um, and I was, so to say, I knew every component of it. Um, then we geniuses in IT um, came up with <laughs> layers of abstraction. <laughs> so first it was like, you know what? Forget about the server. We can take 10 servers, make them look like one. That was virtualization. Then we said, you know what? Don't worry about that either. Now we're going to slice that one big virtualized thing back into 10 smaller things. Call it containers. That was containerization. Now, genius, like branding wise, I mean, it's just perfect. Serverless. Still runs on a server, of course. <laughs> It's like we take the container, forget about the container, forget about the server, just write something and put it here and it will run, right? All of this still runs on a server and data center, nothing changed. It is just that we made it like more and more complicated. Um, and then we came up even because we are geniuses, we are really good at abstraction. We came up with this, which was the cloud. So then we said, you know what? this data center thing that's really annoying. Let's not think about that. Because actually when, so if you go to a cloud region and you select the region, people say, that's the data center. Actually a region is three data centers already. You have no clue where you are physically. It's, you know you are somewhere in Ireland, but there's three different ones you yeah. don't know. And so now look at this picture. And now I say to you, What's the environmental impact of the server? Yeah, good luck finding that out. <laughs> because you go up here, you don't know which data center you are, you don't know which server you're on, you, you, have, you don't even know what the model of the server is, and you don't know what the energy is that goes in here. You, it's so hard because we added all these layers. Um, so in order to to actually do this, to do this measurement, we need to go back to this concept that I explained to you in the morning, or in the morning, I said in the uh, beginning, oops, uh, which is this digital resource. That's why we came up with this. Because all of this produces some form of resource. For me, it's compute, memory, and storage. And I say digital resources to make it easier. Um, and this, that's the output of that very complicated um, infrastructure. And actually, I do like this. That's easier. Um, so you have digital resources. These things go in there, compute. Uh, th th that's what it means to me. I need to do it differently. Um, and then the only question is, for each unit of digital resource, so for each unit of compute, memory, and storage, I want to know the environmental impact. Why? Because then it's simple multiplication. If I know that my application or my product uses a gigabyte of memory, and I know that a gigabyte of memory has one kilo of CO2, one multiplied by one is one. Yeah? Um, if I know that my application uses 500 CPUs for the whole year, and each CPU is one kilowatt of power consumption, it's 500 kilowatts per year. Um, so we can actually use this abstraction that we made to also think about environmental impact in an abstract way. Who's a mathematician? Good, nobody, good. Um, you, so you can do this conversion of the, so this information, almost every single digital product on this planet has this. If you go to IT operations, if you look at companies like Dynatrace, that's their entire business, is to help you monitor the re digital resource consumption of an application. You have Prometheus, you have all these monitoring systems that do nothing else but monitor this. And so 
using a bit of math, you can actually convert, at least for compute, which is one of the largest drivers of, um, of all this environmental impact, um, you can get there mathematically. And since there's no mathematicians here, I'm not going to go too deep. There's a whole paper about this. Um, because ironically, CPUs and most computers behave in a very linear, predictable way. So if this, I'm sure you noticed, if this is at really 100% utilization, the fans turn on. So then the power consumption is the highest. And actually, you can train a machine learning model, which we did, uh, which a group of people did that are friends of us. You can actually guess the power consumption of this computer. Just guess by knowing how a CPU works mechan like under the hood. You can say, if your application uses 80% of the CPU, that's the power consumption going to be. You don't need to know anything from anybody. So you can, to go back to this, you can calculate the environmental impact of this without talking to any of these people down here, per se. Because I did that for you, I went and asked them all, and either they don't know it, or they don't want to give it. <laughs> so you, you, gotta, you gotta basically ignore this and do your own stuff. Um, so there's math, um, and that's, you can use this math, mostly you heard me now say for energy. So that's the, the one part of the equation. Now, you mentioned this earlier already by Samsung phones and figuring out the impact of the actual hardware. So the, this, the physical part, that's a bit more difficult. Luckily, we have scientists and we have smart software engineers. Um, so Fraunhofer Institute in Germany and Öko Institute came up with a way. <laughs> it's a bit like a typical scientist. They disassembled this thing. And they basically said, well, if I have you, who has seen a memory stick that's in there? I should have put a photo. Who, has, who knows what a CPU looks like, this little thingy? OK. Um, so they basically said, well, how much silicon is on a CPU? Oh, four grams. And how much blah. And they did this for every single thing that's in here. It was an eight-year project. It was already 10 years ago. Eight years, they just looked at every single piece that is in this server, which gives you, oh, this is not readable. Anyways, which, um, um, which build a model that allows you to basically, as long as you know how many CPUs are in here, which you know for even a virtual machine, you know, how much memory, how much storage, how much digital resource in here, with that model, you can guess the total hard environmental impact, adiabatic depletion potential, carbon emissions from manufacturing, you can, just get a basic estimation. And Boa Vista, which I unfortunately can't read it, but uh, I can, when you see the slides later, there is a documentation, if you Google it, uh, the Boa Vista API, um, where you can, they basically took, that was a spreadsheet, and they built it into an API. And when you send to this API, how many CPU, how much memory, how much disk, how much um, yeah, power supply do you need, disk, memory, and compute, uh, it will give you everything that I just showed you in this environmental impact report back automatically. Uh, it's a guess. It's not accurate, not at all, but it's a very good guess um, based on what we know. Um, yeah, and this is for the real nerds. If you are not in a virtualized environment, so if you're on your own computer, for example, you can use IPMI and REPO interfaces to measure things. But I just want to point out that this one is just for research, and this one is usually only available in servers. Um, it's a special chip that sits on the motherboard and can tell you the can tell you a lot about the machine. But usually, in most modern applications, you can't access this. That's why I wouldn't worry about it so much. Um, okay, it's very nerdy. I stop questions. Comments there. Yes. 
Yeah, you can. That's uh, that's exactly the point. If you combine monitoring data for a product, so a very simple product, let's say it's an API. And if you know how many requests go into that API, and you also know how much resources were used for each request, then with these formulas, you can just convert that into environmental impact. And that's the con most the simplest way we could come up with to um, to make it almost frictionless to calculate um, environmental impact. No, because that would that only works. A fridge is a fridge. Right? Fridges are comparable, but software is you can build so many different things with software that it would have to be functionally identical. You can yeah. We can talk about this to, after later I will explain you. You yes, you could, but it's still not comparable. That's the problem. Yes, and that, that's why I hope today we can you walk away with like at least knowing that it's not that difficult. Well, um, I want to do a break here because I also see that they're coming with stuff. Um, and then we, we take a break for 30 minutes, have some coffee, have some snacks. Um, I don't know how the coffee thing works. I have to find Isidro, but there's people bringing things behind you. And also, I need to take the headset off because it really hurts my ears.
Hello, hello. Can I ask you all to come back or go with Mims again? Whatever you want. Now you stuck with me again. Never. Oh, yeah. Oh, actually. I hope you had some coffee, yeah, and some candy. Yeah, very good. It's very nice to be in Barcelona for that, for the sweets. Um, we have many great things where I live, and I live outside of Amsterdam. We have it's beautiful, but only in summer. Um, <laughs> we have uh, many, many different things, but uh, we don't have so much good food. Um, and we also don't have so much sun. So I'm happy to be here. Um, good. Putting it together. Um, now you remember my little food ingredient list. Now we're going to make it really practical because there's really only two points in the process of making a digital product where this is usefully applied. The first one uh, is, in our opinion, in um, continuous integration and delivery processes. So you could say the factory of modern software is usually some kind of build process. Um, or a deployment process. And when you assemble a piece of software, it doesn't matter if it's a Java application or something being compiled in JavaScript, um, at that moment when you compile it, it, it already uses a lot of resources to get packaged. Um, and that part you can measure and you can attach, so to say, for this version of this software, this is the environmental impact it created um, when it was being assembled. That's not running it, That's I'll get to that, but this is just the assembly process. Um, luckily, because it's everything is, you know, open source is cool. Um, did I put it here? No, it's kind of small. Um, there is some tools that do this now fully automatically. So you put like, um, uh, one is from Green Coding Berlin. Uh, there's tools from Boa Vista. Uh, there's other tools also from Red Hat, like Kepler, I think does it. Um, in any case, if you have a GitLab or GitHub CI CD pipeline, you plug in those open source components in a way, and it gives you this report that shows you for every run, for example, you say, oh, I added this feature, all of a sudden my impact went through the roof, right? So you can directly correlate, oh, with this pull request or this feature addition, um, we increased our environment into impact by X, which also helps to explain to stakeholders, look, this was the consequence of your ticket right um that's one place and if you're really curious i'm, I'm going to explain you we've also built some of these tools ourselves in open in, as open source um, things uh, and i can show you how to run them if you are interested in that afterwards later um one of those tools is uh, is a gitlab extension again it's a lot of output but at the end of the day this generates essentially a text version of that and we have this, for example, for our own website, for the SDIA website, but also for our 
or wiki everything we build we have we generate this environmental impact report so that we can also choose to remove things um, again and we constantly remind ourselves like look every version does something every ci run every cd run um, and it's a very helpful tool in our opinion to to drive change to, to have this data always available um, the second place where it's really useful to do measurements is when applications are running, right? And now comes the plug. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what, I, what I said before, most monitoring, most IT operations, they, there's so many words now like DevOps, CloudOps, whatever. But most of the operations teams that I have ever seen and that I've also met through this work have some kind of IT monitoring system, sometimes sophisticated, sometimes less sophisticated. Even in large corporates, uh, there is IT monitoring systems that record the memory, CPU, and storage consumption per application, sometimes even more detailed per function. Um, and again, with these formulas that I showed you earlier, you can um, uh, you can basically convert that into environmental impact. And Dynatrace did that using the same math um, that I showed you earlier. And they just built an app inside Dynatrace called the Carbon Impact app, where you can actually get, um, they, they literally just convert what you already measured into environmental impact. So you even get historic data um, for, for stuff you did a year ago. Um, so so everything we do is open so in a way they kind of just took it and then they sent a press release saying we took your stuff uh, no we helped a bit yes they also made it better to be honest they they a lot of this math can be done better and there were some people that are very good at math and they made it better um but it was it was a collaboration ish but we for me it's always very important to be commercially like to be independent as a nonprofit so we didn't get paid to help them build that tool or something like this um, another non more open source tool that probably was the first that's used by the BBC uh, in the UK to measure the environmental impact of their in entire infrastructure is Scafandre which is a, a plugin for Prometheus uh, that's really focused on energy um, but it gives you very detailed readings like yeah you can see, I mean, you see the precision of the graphs of like energy consumption. So it's very, very granular. I think it's a bit over the top, uh, but it, it's it's out there um, and it's very easy to install if you if you run your own infrastructure. This usually does not work in cloud, just that you know. This, um, the formulas, sorry, <laughs> Dynatrace does. Uh, the, the formulas, huh? No, sorry. The the formulas, um, look at this nice office. Um, um, the formulas that I showed you, they work uh, in, in cloud and everything we do um, works in cloud. But because the cloud is so heavily virtualized, sometimes it's very hard to get to the actual facts. So um, you need a lot of estimation models. This works if you own your own servers or if you have your own corporate data center, this you can do there. Um, and I just want to say that this movement of building measurement tools is huge right now. Um, inside the inside Kubernetes is, um, for example, the CNCF has a sustainability working group. They're building Kubernetes plugins that automate all of this. So I would estimate that within a year for almost every single platform that you're using for procuring digital resources, there will be plugins that give you environmental impact. Um, and the community, especially ops community is really like, Fabulous, we can do something new and we can do something helpful. Um, and I, I'm really happy to see that momentum. There's a lot of firepower there. Okay, now to the really interesting part where I also need your help. Because um, I don't know what to do, but maybe you know what to do. No, I know, I know some things to do. Um, but I want to open the room a bit and because you just had coffee, now the coffee should have kicked in. It's like, 10 minutes, huh? caffeine is slowly coming. Uh, so I want to hear, now that you've heard kind of what are we trying to measure, why are we trying to measure it, what is sustainability about finding balance, what do you think we can do? That's a good one, yeah. What kind of questions?
Ja. Could it be that you're an engineer? No. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So make better measurement devices, so to say. Yeah. Standardization. Yeah. It's good stuff. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's so, interesting. Yep. Do you agree, disagree? I watch one minute of, of um, YouTube videos and it consumes 20 minutes of our time. If you do it perfectly for the common system, you are perfectly consistent. Then it just seems to be a little blue. It seems to be a little bit more attention to the system. And then I do what I do. What you say? that resources without giving up on functionality. Um, I mean, measurement is something, from my perspective, other people do. Yeah, they can give me the numbers, and I, I don't care them. But I mean, that, that is really something where I would say there is a lot of potential. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can also talk about reducing functionality in a way which is uh, environmentally, uh, environment friendly. But I, I would say there is so much waste of software, so much waste of resources for nothing, that that is a good point to start on. Yeah. 
just go. Yeah. Yeah, this is this idea of nudging, yeah. If we're at that, I don't. I think. I think probably um, there's probably machines are better at writing code than people to begin with. But that's a hello. No, it's coming. Um, interesting. I think the nudging piece is uh, is very useful. This um, teaching people. Okay, on the um, on the software itself, is there is there something that that any of you can think of that we that we can do tomorrow? Um, to solve this problem, to, to build software that consumes less resources? Is there something obvious? Yeah. So choose different libraries, yeah. Yeah. But then you you run into this feature reduction problem potentially, right? That you that you that you're sacrificing features for uh, or sacrificing functionality, not features, um, for better perf less resource consumption, right? Uh, interesting. Do you want me to show you some? Is that better? Okay. This one. Yes, that's that's the the nudging piece. Um, it's essentially um, even in tech themselves. Like most of what I explained to you today, surprises most of the people. Like how much hardware is there, how much data centers are there. It's like wow, I didn't realize this, but it's quite obvious and it's quite logical. Um, but it helps to nudge people with like, hey, bandwidth doesn't grow on trees. Like you or or even to a certain extent, if if um, My computer would tell me, like, look, you've literally copied this data from computer to computer over the last 15 years. You've never used it. Just get rid of it. Right? It's a, it's a stupid example because data storage is really not such a big problem. Um, but yeah, function disabling functionality is nudging me of like, do you really need this? And also being able um, to um, to turn off features. That's something that um, most products today don't support. So if I What's a good example? Um, 
Asana again, right? Asana used to be just a task list. Now you can do product management, you can do time tracking in it, all these things, but maybe I don't need time tracking, right? Uh, and maybe I can just turn that off and that results in a resource, resource savings either in the front end or in the back end, doesn't really matter. Uh, but people need to have choice and they need to be aware. And that's, I think, can be solved very well within the products themselves, um, given that the, the people in the company buy into that. Um, Good. But just talking about it helps. So go talk about it. Um, this one, um, I start with the more social ones and I get to the more technical ones. Um, a lot of these discussions around sustainability and environmentalism are like values and belief discussions. Right? You're like, yeah, but it can't be that bad. Or yes, we bought, but we bought green energy. These are all like ways to justify the fact that most digital company's growth comes with environmental impact. So does everybody else. If Seat makes a car, that car has environmental impact, there's nobody going to argue about that. But in the digital world, it's still, you have a lot of arguments like what is true and what is not. <clears throat> and so this measurement piece and this, what I talked to a lot about before, um, is a great tool to have fact-based conversations and really educate people like, look, I measured it, this is the environmental impact. We have to do something about this. Right? It's a bit scary. A lot of people that I know in very large companies in the tech space that measured this, once they have gotten the report, they almost fell off their chairs. And they got like, it is so bad that they got, uh, like basically you cannot publish this or show this to anybody. Right? But that's a good thing. It sounds bad, but it's a good thing because all of a sudden now everybody's aware in the organization and everybody's like, we have to reduce it before we release it, right? Um, so that's, transparency is a great tool for that. Um, now to the really simple ones uh, that we found earlier already. And this one is, I'll explain it first, but this is from ABN Emro, one of the largest banks in the Netherlands. They have a really nice sustainable IT team. Um, I have a, if Vibren is very approachable if you want to talk to him. Um, we talked about this earlier. My mom's WordPress blog runs almost on the same infrastructure than MasterCard and Visa's payment network. It's almost exactly the same, tier three or tier four infrastructure. And what ABN Emro did, they realized this, they said, hold on a sec. So first of all, half of our applications at night, there's nobody at the office. Why are they running, right? And they developed this classification system that basically starts with always off or default off. So they have literally applications that are off until somebody presses a button and says, I need the invoicing system now. And then the invoicing server starts and only then is running. Yes, that creates a 30 second to one minute delay, but that's to most people actually quite acceptable, especially for an application that you need once a month. Yeah? Um, and it goes all the way to always on. For example, if you have a trading system, trading in a bank happens 24 seven, those systems need to be running. There's not much you can do, but there's basically four classes that start with the assumption this can be off all the time. We will only boot this application when it's really, really necessary. And I don't think you will find a lot of organizations today that have that mindset for internal tooling. I think if you leave the office, most of the applications are still running, even though there's maybe nobody working. <laughs> right. So this is actually something very simple. It's again from a PowerPoint slide of a, of a bank. And honestly, if a bank with 15,000 employees can, and they actually implemented this, it's not like, oh, they made this strategy. They made this, implemented this already five years ago, um, that it works and it's operational and it helped them reduce their footprint quite drastically. Um, a good statistic in that context is that the average corporate in the United States, unfortunately we only have it for the US, has 400 different tools um, that employees can lose like from HR tools to this. I want to see the, the human that can use 400 tools at the same time anyways. So most of them are probably in, don't, can be turned off most of the time. Um, this is a, um, personally to me, a very attractive one, but it's a bit like a capitalistic one. I have to say, I would love to see. So, so when, when zoom started, it was a video calling app. Right? And then it grew and grew and grew. And now it's, they absorbed a Miro feature, which is a whiteboard. 
Now they do transcriptions. Now they do chat. They do calendar. Um, they do uh, video conferencing systems. They sell TVs because in in everybody has this dream of this WeChat platform that we can build digital products that do everything for everyone, right? And that's basically differentiation through features. We just keep adding more stuff. People will stay or people will use it more. But why not differentiate through simplicity, minimalism, sustainability, through balance? And I think I see a big movement of humans being more and more overwhelmed and seeking out more simpler things, also in terms of digital products. And I think, economically speaking, it would be great if we can differentiate digital products through how little they do environmental impact um, rather than just features. But it's a, a dream that CEOs must listen to. <laughs> I, I look at you from a product management perspective. It's hard, right? But it's on the marketing campaign, it's the first word. That's the... No. No. And yeah, and um, the good thing is that at least starting next year with the new European greenwashing uh, directive, this word will disappear a lot. So you see it already, Danone had to remove it from all their yogurts because of the regulation that will come that they don't have climate neutral yogurt anymore. Um, so this this it will become hard. It will, the bar will move higher and higher and how to when you can actually say that something is sustainable, which I think will maybe also make the prioritization, right? Um, at least that's the thesis. Um, good. The there is. Um, so if you want more, so the, the problem of these best practices is that a lot of them have never been really tested. So I showed you mostly things that um, uh, that I know that work, which is very little because again, very little data, very little transparency. Um, there is however, like this whole movement now to figure this out. Yeah? Uh, for all the front end people, there is a W3C sustainability working group that's really about web development, for all the people who are obsessed with building streaming systems, there's the greening of streaming, which is the TV industry, Netflix, all these guys coming together, figuring out how to how to do best practices for streaming. Uh, Boa Vista is a French community, again, mostly IT consultants and uh, digital product firms coming together, figuring out how to build tooling. Um, Climate Action Tech is like, I think like 15,000 people, mostly, in the digital product space who care about climate, which also has a lot of these uh, things that I talk about in it. The Green Web Foundation, again, mostly front end web based um, research. Um, and then, of course, the Green Software Foundation. Though, uh, if you know me, you know that I will be very, I'm a bit critical of them. They're US based. You can only really get into it if you are corporate paying uh, and it's very carbon obsessed. <laughs> Everything they do is around carbon. Um, but they have a very good uh, catalog of practices. Again, though, not tested, but ideas, so to say. Um, and then there's us, but we have, we're probably, um, we do mostly this, <laughs> like awareness. Um, we're building something that uh, I hope that will make consuming this a lot easier. Uh, we're building this wiki, which is the domain is this.wiki. Um, where we collect all the best practices, all the tools, um, and where we independently verify them so that you know like this actually works. Um, because we can do that because we don't get paid by any of these parties. So we, we can really provide, like we can really say, this works, this does not work. Um, that's what we're working on right now. If you want to help with that, let me know. Uh, there's a lot of writing and editing to do. Um, and also, if you have ideas, like I think that nobody reads anything anymore. That's my thesis in life. So if you are, if you have ideas on how to put it into another format uh, or better ways to do this, let me know. Um, standards. It was mentioned a few times 
today. There is a few things going on on international level and European level to standardize a lot of the things that I told you about. Um, we are in all of them because I have discovered that I'm pretty good at lobbying a few years ago. So I'm lobbying that everything you saw today is actually becomes like ground truth, including that transparency label uh, is in Europe at the moment. Um, and if you want a digital product to be certified for sustainability, of course, the Germans, they invented, um, it's really funny. This thing was invented by the government 50 years ago for toilet paper. Um, you know that really uncomfortable toilet paper that looks like sandpaper that's out of recycled. That's Blue Angel certified. This means Blue Angel. It has this little angel on it. Um, and they expanded this to every category of products that the government buys, from toasters to coffee machines. And eventually they're like, but we also buy software. And so they came up with this criteria catalog that when you read it, you're going to be like, oh, shit. This is so difficult. It, um, they set the bar very, very high. There's so far only one piece of software that has ever qualified for this Blue Angel, which is Oculus, which is the PDF reader of Linux KDE that has passed this test. <laughs> so, but I do recommend reading through the criteria because it shows you like how far you could technically go. Um, I'm not, it's more than 180 criteria, but it goes like software has to be uninstallable. Um, over a period of 15 years, the piece of product cannot change its how much resources it needs. It addresses like every, the social aspects, it addresses everything you could possibly think of. But I can tell you as a software person myself, it, there are some things in there that are very hard to attain. Yeah. Uh, and it's not written for web applications, for example. It has to be uninstallable, which for web stuff. But it's a really good, I use this as the holy grail. This is like, if, you can, if we can get there, fantastic. Um, yeah. Now I ran out of content. So I need questions. <laughs> we start there because you're new. Yeah. So I'm not really sure about the major release date or any issues about sustainability or uh, the science to the future of the world. Yeah. Now, this is a fantastic question. I'll tell you why. The FinOps Foundation, which is basically an, a nonprofit dedicated to teaching people how to reduce cost in cloud, uh, did an experiment. They gave two ops teams the same task. Um, so to, to basically reduce the amount of cloud resources needed for an application. But one team, they said, your objective is cost. And the other team, they said, it's cost and carbon. And the first team improved the performance cost-wise by 30%, second team by 80%. Why? Because people care about the environment and it's a much better motivational. Yeah, but it, it works not in all cases, but it works in a lot of cases that I would argue that most techies in some way, they care. And if you say like optimize against just cost, they're like, ah, whatever, man, we make so much money here. It doesn't matter. But if you say also optimize for the environment, you get better cost improvements always. Sustainability in a lot of ways always drives also better cost outcomes, but you can motivate people in a different way to perform, outperform. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Otherwise, send them to me. You know, take four hours with me, they will be like, I'm ready. <laughs> There was another question. Yeah. Ah. Translated to a kind of like production uh, deadness. 
That's also a really good question. And you are right. I went over it a bit too fast. Um, Yes, you build all the time, right? So the, the resources you need for the final build is just a fraction of the whole. Yep. Uh, so the idea is, um, so we did this with more than 100 different open source projects. So so we, we actually did an experiment um, where we, my God, that's so much authentication stuff. Um, I want to I want to show it to you what it looks like live. That's why I'm uh, doing this. Um, so we did an experiment, and we wanted to measure open source components. Now, uh, open source tools. Some with user interface, some without. And the question was, okay, but how do we simulate usage? And then most of the academics in our group said, well, we can write a scenario. And then I, because I have a background in, in, in software, I said, oh, but they have integration tests, right? And integration tests are basically a usage simulator. So it's uh, automated things that either with a fake browser or just with code, test every single feature of that piece of software, right? Everything is being called once. So can we make an assumption that if there is 80% or 100% coverage with integration tests, that every line of code is executed Therefore, um, the result of, of those tests is equal to one user using the product. Well, we can. That's, that's a reasonable assumption. And then we measured the execution of those integration tests. And sometimes we have open source tools where the integration tests run about 28 minutes. And that leads to, let's say, a kilowatt of energy consumption. One of these systems was Drupal. Drupal has 800,000 active installations added per month or so. So then you can say, well, how many visitors? Uh, you can extrapolate it further and further. My point is that we run these integration tests as a proxy to get to one user. How much does one user generate in environmental impact? And that's what we do in CI CD. So not just the build, but also we, we simulate one usage unit. Um, and I hope I can show it to you. Uh, like this. Does it answer the question? In this case, you can even optimize tests for getting better measurements. Right? Yeah, you can also cheat. Uh, by removing tests, you increase the environmental performance of your software. <laughs> Which was the first thing that everybody pointed out. Like, yeah, but you can just remove tests. I'm like, yes, you could. But if that is the point, then maybe you shouldn't do it to begin with. Um, Finally, confirm. Oh, you don't see it anyways. OK, I'll show you. Um, new share. Uh, this one. OK, so I show you based on our website. This is public. You can also look at it. Um, so our website, I start with the first example, doesn't have integration tests. It just, um, it's a statically compiled website using Gatsby for all the front-end developers. So here we just measure the build process. So if I look at the results, uh, build, and you see here, this is also, for us, we get the raw data of environmental impact. It's a very long uh, thing, but at the end of the day, only this matters. All right, so Again, lots of commas, but for our website, it builds for like three and a half minutes. So we are only responsible for three and a half minutes of environmental impact of the underlying server. So you get very tiny, tiny numbers, but they still matter. It doesn't really, it, it's just not, it's just um, small numbers. Uh, but if you render them as a graph, which I hope now demo effect. <laughs> yes. Um, or not, I don't have enough builds. Uh, normally these things stack next to each other. Then you can basically just compare from build to build um, how your performance got better or worse. Now they are laying on top of each other. You see like this one was a lot more and has a lot more environmental impact than the yellow one. So something changed. I actually know what changed. I can't tell you. 
a secret. Um, no, we we added a we added a very large feature to our website, and all of a sudden this went uh, through the roof. Yeah, is and these numbers in environmental science they can be very confusing, but I think as a graph it's very easy to say like this build was worse than the other, and then you just look at um, what have I changed. Right? So that's the first example. Um, and then how do I go back there? And the second one is the integration test. Uh, demos. No. No. Uh, Flask is probably. Uh oh. Yeah, oh, lucky me. So here you see this one also only runs a minute, but this one uh, actually runs all these tests. So essentially this is our usage simulator. We, we say whoever is using this Python library called Flask, and actually Flask has a test coverage of like 98%. So we say, well, this test, as you can see, executes every single feature that this thing has. So whatever the result down here, then you can look at how many people use Flask. There's some numbers on this. Let's say 100 million people use Flask. Then you can multiply these numbers by 100 million, and you have a relatively representative environmental impact of Flask. That's how we did that. Um, and this is a laboratory in GitLab that's completely open. So if you wanted to, that's why there's so many silly repositories there. If you wanted to say like, hey, I have this open source thing that I built, uh, don't upload like corporate stuff there, it's not safe or anything. But if you just want to experiment, um, you can. It's uh, you can, everybody can run stuff here. So here people create just like a little bit of, if I already see that there is a key file in there, I'm like, hmm. Um, and you can you can just upload code and it will run on our test system and it will always give you the environmental impact assessment. Um, we also ran, uh, if you're curious, we compared programming languages, which is not very uh, representative. Um, where was that demo? No, language test. Uh, 17 seconds, my God. Yeah. Um, okay, not a good example. Here we just, we basically let all the different programming languages compute Fubinatrin numbers to see which programming language can do it better which was something that a lot of governments were like, which is the most energy efficient programming language? And we said that's a stupid question, yet we still did it. So there you go. Um, I also have it as a table. Other questions or comments? Huh? Actually, no. Uh... I don't remember. I think it was probably Go. According to also current HIP uh, logic, it's probably Go. Um, no, here, here it is. I found it. Uh, no, it's not the right graph. Here is the programming languages. Um, whatever this is. No, Node has the highest amount of measurements. Relevant standard. Oh, this is just a differential, sorry. Okay, it's not in here, I think. Uh, 
this report that I'm dragging this from is 175 pages. It has a lot of graphs in there. Um, it will soon be released. Yeah. Yeah, but they some of them behave really strange that if you run them long enough, then they get better, for example. But uh, the problem is with most of the interpreted languages, like you have this ramp up time. It takes Node.js a moment to boot, Python a moment to boot, and C++ doesn't have that. And that already messes with all your results. It's complicated. Don't compare programming languages. It makes no sense. Uh, there was another question, right? Yeah. That's the politics again. Um, I think there's the saying um, to shoot with a bazooka at a little bird. Uh, I think that there is a lot of potential in LLMs to solve a lot of very interesting problems. But to be honest, the way it's probably going to be used in the next five years is to generate more content that we all don't want to consume. I already like every block image is now generated with AI and it, it, that's not necessary. Like there's no reason for that. Um, and it's it, so, so there, either you constrain how technology is being used um, or you constrain how much resources it uses, which then automatically constrains who can use it. Uh, but it's too cheap and it's too accessible and it will not at the moment. I don't think it will be used for for the things that it's sold to us as the solution for. Um, and I think it's a, can I go really philosophical? Okay. Um, so in order to train an AI model, you need an insane amount of computation. Now the question is, and you need a lot of data. Question is, how come there's companies that have this amount of compute and have this amount of data. When you look at the economics, it costs about to build a, an infrastructure that can train something like ChatGPT costs about $12 billion. Now, you, um, how do I say this? Yeah, but they also just layer on top, but you still need to one, at one point you need to train the fundamental thing. Now, how did OpenAI do that? How did they pay 12 billion? Well, they didn't because Microsoft gave them the infrastructure for free. And then you wonder like, how can Microsoft afford to give away $12 billion worth of infrastructure? Well, they can't, you all paid for it because what they did is they took Microsoft Azure cloud and they looked at, they, they have a lot of underutilized capacity there because people book something, but don't actually use it. And they trained the model on that infrastructure using all the paid for, but underutilized capacity. So they basically, um, they, they abused infrastructure that, um, yeah, they only have because we paid for it. And then they use that to build a model that nobody else in the world can build because nobody has access to the scale of infrastructure, right? That's what Europe is really struggling with. Like, where do we train these things? for our own, like a Spanish version or a German version, or we can't, right? And then you have to ask the question, how come these companies are so big and have basically a monopoly on that infrastructure? And I think that's a much more interesting question than what do we do with AI? The question is how come it came to be, how come this exists? And then the second really philosophical question is how come we had no choice in stopping it, right? Nobody, they just, it's just a bit like Elon Musk says, electric cars are the future. And all of a sudden he just pumps electric cars in the market. He's like, buy them, buy them, buy them. And, uh, and everybody in Europe was like, hey, hey, what, what? isn't the hydrogen car better than a lithium car? No, buy the lithium car. It's good. Don't worry about it. And that's a bit with AI the same. Like we are confronted with it. 10 minutes later, you are like, if you as an employee are not using it, you're going to be left behind. You're going to lose your job. 
hat and you create this anxiety and everybody's like, oh my God, I gotta use this. But as a society, we could have also said, maybe we don't want this, right? And and I feel like this philosophical decision point doesn't happen anymore with digital technology. We are just confronted with it and then we have to use it. And if we don't use it, we're gonna be left behind. And there's a really strange narrative in a democracy because I remember I remember we, I was able to vote on things at some point. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, no, because a lot of people have tried always to drag us down that route of like rating things, and I, uh, I in this case, I always refused. So no, I don't have data on that. I also think that's the role of academia to come up with that, not not the role of nonprofits, um, because it gets very loaded and very political. Because, for example, the blockchain lobby is very strong, the AI lobby is very strong, right? And you. Um, okay. They will, they will do a lot to discredit you. And so I've always stayed away from rating any type of recommendation on technology. I am not pro-blockchain or against. I have no opinion. I say all digital products, all digital technology creates environmental impact. All of it. Some more, some less. Um, but I, I try to stay away from this. Uh, I, uh, to your point of uh, infrastructure, though, um, to go one step back, um, the other thing that's going to happen now, so no scientific organization has infrastructure to train LLMs and no government does either. But the biggest application of AI is will be military, obviously, by targeting systems, autonomous systems. So imagine now every government in the world trying to copy that infrastructure of the scale to, that you need to train a foundational model. Like the amount of servers, the amount of compute, the amount of energy that will be needed to power this will be insane. And it's all because somehow we couldn't stop the release from LLMs into the public. Nobody was able to say, no, we don't want this. Right? And that's a bit, it's really, uh, to me, it's really strange. It, make, it makes me always feel a little bit powerless in the digital discussion, like cannot stop anything, just have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. 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 So
No, it's not. No, no, so there's a lot to unpack there. First one, the Instagram point. There is, of course, you should have competitions, you should have innovation. I'm not against that, but Instagram introducing chat inside Instagram makes no sense. The parent company already has two other messengers. They do it to get people to open the app more. It has nothing to do with differentiation. It's just addiction driving, right? And that, to me, is different. It's this, it's this feature creep to get usage up, to get people to use it more. So you just add more features so people spend more time there, right? And that's simply a, a wrong business metric. That's also not a metric of innovation, right? Um, innovation is really about um, in my opinion, also, especially in, in the digital space, we need new business models. Right? If you really think about it, Google, Meta, most of these companies are built on, like Microsoft is built on licensing. That's the core business model. Uh, Google and Meta on advertising. Where, where's the innovation there? Right? We need business models now that make money through less, to buy, by, for example, by reducing resource use. Like, I, I, haven't, I haven't seen them yet, but the biggest problem in sustainability is we need business models that are not based on increased consumption. That's one, but that's a very specific one, yes? But there, like, it needs to be, like a recycling company has always had a, let's say, positive business model in that sense, but we need those as well for digital products. Um, that's the first one. The second one on your uh, scope thing, yes, Europe is like very advanced. I don't think it's a disadvantage if that we are so obsessed with environmental impact because it also comes with a cost advantage most of the time. Um, I do want to remind you though that, for example, half of the planet is not connected to the internet to begin with. Um, and we are the heaviest users um, in the world, Europe, like the developed world, the Western world. We are the heaviest users of all these things. Yes, so we have also an outsized share of responsibility or relevance to us, yeah. Um, I, what's a good example? Um, the uh, good example is Sweden, for example, right? Is, is one of the is considered one of the most sustainable countries in the world. Yet the average person in Sweden now has three point five phones. Right? They have actually. They are. There's this graph. Um, they are the European leader in electronic waste. Nobody generates more electronic waste than Sweden because they're so digitalized. They're so, they have a work laptop, a home laptop, a computer at home. The kids have an iMac. The, the other kid has a laptop. Each, has, each parent has two phones, work and personal. Like, it's just insane. And so compared to the rest of the world, we have an outsized chunk of this responsibility, if that makes sense. Um, to your, yeah, I don't think it's anti-entrepreneurship, but I think it's actually the opposite. It opens in the digital product space, 
it's currently very concentrated as a lot of very large companies and we need a new vector to compete with them and this in my opinion could be a vector because you're not going to compete on scale you're not going to compete on talent you're not going to compete on infrastructure all of these things they rule so this is a discipline you could create search that's maybe not the best search but that has the lowest environmental impact look at equasia for example they didn't do anything they just put a new user interface on bing and they said we use the advertising revenue to plant trees which is it's not it's not the greatest example on earth but they have two percent market share now right which is something but they grew they have a lot of employees they they didn't innovate on search itself but at least they tried something to to break the google uh, monopoly right and they use sustainability as the vector It's hard, yeah. A law. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, it's our job to create uh, market constraints. Yes, I agree. Yeah. Ironically, so so you mentioned, for example, China, right? I don't know how many of you actually read Chinese digital regulation. I do as a hobby. Uh, they are the most advanced in shutting down everything they don't like. They shut down gaming for children because they saw that kids have this hump and that it's unhealthy, so they just shut it down. They have the most sophisticated AI regulation that I've ever seen. It's technically so thought through. Yes, it's not about environmentalism, but it is always about social outcomes. Like they are like, we want to have control, which we don't agree with in Europe that China has basically built its own internet, but they have enforced their values, which is we want control, we want state level control. And they have done it successfully through regulation. And it has not created it has not hurt the companies. They still have these billion dollar mega corporations, right? It's still there. Um, and they, they did it completely different to the US and it still worked. But they have, if you really think about it, they really said, this is how we want the digital world to work. And they have enforced that in laws. Again, we don't have to agree with it, but it, it's possible and it worked. And now Europe is trying to do the same, but respecting freedom, liberalism, right? We try to do it in, a, in our way. And that's, that's interesting, I think. And I'm sure the Middle East and other regions will do find, need to find their own way but it will lead to an internet that doesn't look so uniform anymore. And that's, I think a lot of people in the open source, original internet communities are really um, struggling with that idea that it will not be one uniform public free space. I think, I mean, you already, like the idea has already been floating around. This is the word of sovereignty that's been floating around. So I, I think these ideas are there. I, I can tell you that you no country has enough energy or access to servers or GPUs or whatever to actually do any of it, but they are thinking about it. And that's a, I think it's not a good thought, to be honest. 
that race that race is already happening i can i don't know how what do you mean do you mean like spy equipment We already we had it actually in most of Europe, but it was bought by uh, U.S. infrastructure companies and funds. Um, there has been a massive consolidation of data center capacity. This is all stuff you probably never think about or you see, but 80% of all European data centers, even here in Spain, are now owned by U.S.-based uh, companies. Um, no, I think we missed that boat. <laughs> I think that that boat has. Uh, I think the EU is like real. Like a lot of governments are now realizing, like, oh shit, we sold. Like it's like selling your power grid. Right? So actually, China tried to buy Europe's largest power grid, and then immediately EU said, ah, no, we're not selling our power grid. But with digital infrastructure, fiber also is all gone, and uh, data centers, we've sold it. We almost it's all gone. It's we don't own it anymore. Um, it's also the idea that the internet is a free space. I mean, the internet is like privately owned networks meeting at one point and connecting voluntarily to each other, but it's not free. Everybody pays for their mobile data and their internet at home. None of it is open or free in that sense. It feels like that, but it's not. It's private. It's all private. Yes. I agree. On the flip side, for example, the UK migrated 80% of its government infrastructure to uh, Azure. Also, um, and most um, most governments long time ago consolidated all their data centers into like co-location facilities, which are mostly run by U.S. Um, it's how it is, but we are also not enemies, right? So it's okay. We can share infrastructure, but we just need to be. I, I don't think it's a good idea that every country tries to build their own anyways. That's not how it works. We need to figure out how to share better, how to share without being uh, taking risks. Now you. You're done listening to me, I think. You can see it in your faces. It's time for alcohol and food. Um, almost done. Oh. Okay. I'm going to get the other ones, and then I give you five points that you can walk away with a bit more energized. And uh, But I need to get the other people first, otherwise I have to say it twice. Yeah? So don't run away. I have the card. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Need to collect some people. <laughs> hey, get you guys to come. Looks really nice. Yeah. They're coming. I can do a waiting dance, but I'm not a good dancer. Yes, we have, uh, yeah, we have like uh, a whole knowledge hub filled with like, here I show you why we wait. Um, this still needs to go into the new wiki, but it's already here. Oh. 
No, let's... Oh, there. Yeah. So, this is, I think, what you are, what you mean. Uh, and then for here is basically for each type of um, application and each type of role. So if you're more in a functional role or in an architectural role or in a development role, there's different types of recommendations, like what you can do right now. Um, and this is what we usually give out to uh, to development teams. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you ask me afterwards, I'll give you the link then. Easier. Is everybody back? Looks like it. If Mims is here. Uh, there. Cool. Now, everybody's ready. I can see it in your faces. Everybody's ready for food and for alcohol, but you still have to listen to me. That's my. It's the power that I have. I have no, not a lot of power, but I am in charge. Who goes where? No, kidding. Um, so what you can do now is you can give us money. If you want, <laughs> um, it helps. We used to be, we used to have companies fund us, and we choose not to do that anymore to be like completely independent. Uh, but now it means that we really rely on like either governments being nice to us or people being nice to us. So if you want to, even if it's just a euro, it will be nice. Um, the other one is we want to do a lot more of this, and we want to get. Ideally, uh, or let me put it like this, the sustainable software, sustainable digital product bubble is still very small. Uh, we did a, huh? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bubble of people who care about this is still very small. When we do our largest events in Berlin uh, once a year, we get 200 people. It's fully sold out. But I would say across Europe, there's maybe 5,000, 10,000 people that really work on this. So we want to ideally... Each of these events, I want to see only people that I've never seen before because I want to touch more people and I need you to go out and help me touch more people. But we also do want to do more events. Uh, we want to get better at doing it still as well. Uh, and if, you have, if you're interested to help us organize the next one in Barcelona, for example, and help us get people together, um, that's really appreciated. Um, the more, the merrier. Um, yeah, the, second, the third one we talked a lot about, and at least in this room, um talk to people in your organization as well right it don't have to do all of it but like again i'm gonna if you ask me uh, i'm gonna give you the slides they're also gonna be on the wiki you can steal every slide that's in there and run around with it and talk to people a bit, bit about it if you can make a plan and make a plan to measure something so that you can get information and then from that point you can decide what you're going to do with it um, this one is really important. Yes, exactly. It should be fun. It shouldn't be like against entrepreneurship. It shouldn't be like something that drags you down. It should be enjoyable. You should be proud. You should be happy. I made something that has less environmental impact than all of my competition. Right? It should be fun to, to make something with less. Right? That's cool. Cool people do this. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's something you can walk around. It's good. Uh, it's good for uh, makes you feel good, makes other people feel good. Um, this one, just a small ask. Every time you buy compute, every time you buy something from a club writer, every time you um, you buy a digital product, even buying Dynatrace, if you buy Dynatrace, um, ask them for the environmental impact report. Just ask. They probably won't have it. But by you asking, they're going to get nervous, and then they're going to start making one. It's very simple. You have power. You are the purchaser. Ask them. Especially if your company buys like large amount of cloud, send them an email. Where is the sustainability report? Send it. Um, that's it. Here are the links. If you want to get invited to the next event, there is this link. Isidre is going to give a Dynatrace office tour, including enjoying the views of Barcelona. Uh, he's there. Next. Uh, Wiki is here. And we're going to have drinks and food. Cool. Thank you.
complete.